Just going to use a mean little dog. Hi, right, guys. It is a gorgeous spring evening here. And the collapse of global industrial civilization, you might be able to hear the spring peepers peeping outside and in the pond. We have a regular spring peeper and newt orgy going on. <clears throat> So at least the uh, amphibian Armageddon has not quite taken over here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. But anyway, good Lord, guys, I have, oh boy, I have worked myself into complete and utter exhaustion getting ready for the big grand opening at Bugs in a Jar on Friday, but somehow... We will find some energy to get to some doom and gloom, and we're going to go doom scrolling over at the Guardian, I think, today. But uh, before we do, as I'm going to start, you know, as I've been doing before every rant, we're going to have our overpopulation quote of the day <clears throat> coming from none other than Nicholas Machiavelli political theorist and philosopher who lived from 1469 to 1527. You wouldn't think that Machiavelli would have been thinking about too many people on the planet in the year 1500, but anyway, smart man, take it away. <clears throat> Quote, when every province of the world so teams with inhabitants that they can neither subsist where they are nor remove themselves elsewhere, the world will purge itself in one or another of three ways, floods, plague, and famine. So, of course, it was uh, during Machiavelli's life that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And we all know what that meant for the planet. <clears throat> but anyway, here we are. Uh, so, he died in 1527. There you go. So, 500 years later, I guess, what is going on here? with too many people teeming in the provinces. This is the provinces of the southwestern U.S. Uh, not sure what the Guardian is doing over here. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> what is on the Guardian's mind? They're exposing some of the bright green lies how solar farms took over the California desert. <clears throat> An oasis has become a dead sea. Uh, I have actually seen this damn thing they have a picture of here. <clears throat> I remember the first time I drove past this thing. Wondering what in the hell was this evil looking thing and good lord what has happened since I mean I remember going there when they were first starting this <clears throat> planet eating monstrosity okay take it away guardian <clears throat> deep in the Mojave Desert about halfway between LA and Phoenix a sparkling blue sheet blue sea shimmers on the horizon visible from the I-10 <clears throat> freeway amid the parched plains and sun-baked mountains. It is an improbable sight, a deep blue slick stretching for miles across the Chukwala Valley, forming an endless glistening mirror. But something is not quite right here. Closer up the water's edge, appears blocky and pixelated with a look of low-res computer rendering, while its surface is sculpted in orderly geometric ridges 
like frozen waves. We had a guy pull in the other day towing a big boat, says Don Sned and a local resident. He asked us how to get to the launch ramp to the lake. I don't think he realized he was looking at a lake of solar panels. Yep, a lake of solar panels. And that'll be the next thing there. Is it be floating solar panels. I'm sure the speedboats will have fun dodging them. Anyway, <clears throat> over the last few years, this swath of desert has been steadily carpeted with one of the world's largest concentration of solar power plants forming a sprawling photovoltaic sea on the ground. The scale is almost incomprehensible. The Riverside East Solar Energy Zone. Yeah, I guess, is there a west one? The Riverside East Solar Energy Zone, the ground zero of California's solar energy boom, now stretches for 150,000 acres making it 10 times the size of Manhattan. <clears throat> it is a crucial component of the United States green energy revolution. Solar now makes up about 3% of the U.S. electric supply, but the Biden administration hopes it will reach 45% by 2050 primarily by building more huge plants like this across the country's flat, empty plains. I see plenty of these damn things going up on hillsides all over New York. They didn't have to be in a flat, empty plain in the desert southwest, any south-facing hill. Unbelievable these goddamn solar farms, every south-facing hillside in New York sprouting these damn things. <clears throat> but there is one thing the Federal Bureau of Land Management, uh, otherwise known as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, I did a rant a few days ago on the Bureau of Livestock and Mining which, you know, holds these millions of acres uh, out, mostly in the western U.S., uh, you know, our public lands, which Joe Biden has declared open war. Open war on our public lands, namely the BLM, but the, that the uh, U.S. forest, uh, system is also under direct assault by Joe Biden. Make no mistake about it. Uh, Joe Biden is quickly making a name for himself as every bit as big of a planet eater as Donald Trump uh, ever was. And in some ways, he, just in terms of acreage, of destroying our, our public lands. I'm going to guess that uh, Joe Biden will destroy, will obliterate off the face of this planet more total acreage of our once public lands than Donald Trump ever did in his wildest wet dream. Okay? Is there anybody thinking at this point that Joe Biden uh, is, is some sort of, uh, it gives a flying, uh, you know what, uh, about uh, this country or this planet. Joe Biden is a corporate whore completely in the pocket of the energy corporations, not only in the fossil fuel corporations, but also in, in these giant other uh, energy corporations. Not even Donald Trump uh, was a whore for them. Joe Biden, he makes me want to puke. Anyway, where were we? But there's one thing that the Federal Bureau of Land Management 
the agency tasked, tasked with facilitating these projects on our public lands does not seem to have fully taken into account. The desert is not quite as empty as it thought. Uh, it might look like a barren wilderness, but this stretch of the Mojave is a rich and fragile habitat for endangered species and home to thousand-year-old carbon-capturing woodlands, ancient indigenous cultural sites, and hundreds of people's homes. Residents have watched ruefully for years as solar plants crept over the horizon, bringing noise and pollution that is eroding a way of life in their desert refuge. We feel like we've been sacrificed, which is exactly what they've been. I don't know if Chris Hedges is calling these goddamn solar farms and wind farms and all of the rest of this uh, unadulterated horseshit green energy, whether Chris Hedges has uh, labeled them sacrifice zones. That is exactly what this is, is a sacrifice zone. We are sacrificing this planet to what? To supply energy for too many people. This is a story about overpopulation. Every story I ever cover on this channel is about overpopulation. If there were as many people on this planet as there were when Machiavelli was running around, uh, we would not be reading this story. We feel like we've been sacrificed, said Mark Carrington, who, like Sneddon, lives in the Tamarisk Resort, a community of over 55s near Desert Center, which is increasingly surrounded by solar farms. Quote, we're a senior community and half of us now have breathing difficulties because of all the dust churned up by the construction. I moved here for the clean air, but some days I have to go out wearing goggles. What was an oasis has become a little island in a dead solar sea. There you go. Concerns have intensified following the recent news of a new project called Easley, Easley, that would see the panels come just 200 meters from their backyards. Residents claim that excessive water used by solar plants has contributed to the drying up of local wells while their property values have been hit hard with several now struggling to sell their homes. <clears throat> Same thing going on right here in uh, Cander, New York. Uh, these people trying to get the hell out of the way of these damn solar farms. They can't give their places away. Who wants to live next to one of these damn things? It has been psychologically grueling, says Teresa Pierce, who moved her six years ago, from the constant pounding of the metal posts to the endless dust storms. I now have allergies that I never had before. My arms burn all day long and my nose is always running. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. Yes, Elizabeth Knowles, Director of Community Engagement for Intersect Power. Yes, the company behind the Easley Project said it knew of residents' concerns and was exploring how to move the project further from the community. Quote, since being made aware of their concerns, we have been in regular contact with residents telling them how fucked they are. Hmm. In regular contact with residents to listen to their concerns 
and incorporate their feedback into our planning efforts. Yes, incorporating their backyards into their planning efforts. Uh, <clears throat> the mostly flat expanse southeast of Joshua Tree National Park was originally identified as a prime site for industrial scale solar power under the Obama administration, which fast tracked the first project, Desert Sunlight in 2011. It was the largest solar plant in the world at the time of completion in 2015, covering an area of almost 4,000 acres, and it opened the floodgates for more, yeah, from 4,000 to 150,000 acres and exploding every day. Uh, since then, 15 projects have been completed or are under construction with momentous mythological names like Athos and Oberon. Ultimately, the shimmering patchwork quilt could generate 24 gigawatts annually, enough to power 7 million homes. But as the pace of construction is ramped up, so have voices questioning the cumulative impact of these projects on the desert's populations, both human and non-human. Kevin Emrick worked for the National Park Service for over 20 years before setting up Basin and Range Watch in 2008, a nonprofit that campaigns to conserve desert life. He says solar plants create myriad environmental problems, including habitat destruction and what he calls lethal death traps for birds which dive at the panels, mistaking them for water. He says one project bulldozed 600 acres of designated critical habitat for the endangered desert tortoise, while populations of Mojave fringe toed lizards and bighorn sheep have also been afflicted. Quote, we're trying to solve one environmental problem by creating so many others. And that is exactly what we are doing with this frying pan into the fire bullshit. Trying like every other time as science has tried to fix one problem, all they have done has opened up a bigger hornet's nest of problems than the original problem. There are too many people on this planet. There is one way to solve this problem. It is called the final solution. Anyway, such Adverse environmental impacts are supposed to be prevented by the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, huh? which was approved in 2016 after years of consultation and covers almost 11 million acres of California. But Emmerich and others think the process is flawed allowing streamlined environmental reviews and continual amendments that they say trample conservationist concerns. Uh, quote, the plan talks about the importance of making sure there's enough room between the solar projects to preserve wildlife routes. Yeah, right, says Chris Clark of the National Parks Conservation Association. But the individual assessments for each project 
do not take into account the cumulative impact. The solar plants are blocking endangered species natural transport corridors across the desert, close quote. Much of the critical habitat in question is dry wash woodland made up of what's known as microfill shrubs and trees like Palo Verde, Ironwood, Cat Claw, and Mesquite, which grow in a network of green veins across the desert, but compared with old growth forests of giant redwoods or expanses of venerable Joshua trees, the significance of these small desert shrubs can be hard for the untrained eye to appreciate. Quote, when people look across the desert, they just see scrubby little plants that look dead half the time, says Robin Cobley, a botanist who worked at the BLM for over 20 years as a wildlife biologist before founding the Summer Tree Institute an environmental education nonprofit, quote, but they are missing 90% of the story, which is underground. Her book, The Desert Underground, features illustrated cross sections that reveal the hidden universe of roots extending up to 150 feet below the surface supported by branching networks of fungal mycelium. Quote, this is how we need to look at the desert, she says, turning a diagram from her book upside down. It's an underground forest, just as majestic and important as a giant redwood forest, but we can't see it. The reason this root network is so valuable, she argues, because it operates as an enormous carbon sink where plants breathe in carbon dioxide at the surface and out underground, forming layers of sedimentary rock known as caliche. If left undisturbed, the carbon can remain stored for thousands of years, she said. Desert plants are some of the oldest carbon capturers around. Mojave yuccas can be up to 2,500 years old, while the humble creosote bush can live for over 10,000 years. Uh, these plants also sequester carbon. Um, Quote, by digging these plants up, we are removing the most efficient carbon sequestration units on the planet and releasing millennia of stored carbon back into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the solar panels we are replacing them with have a lifespan of around 25 years close quote and then they uh, they go from here talking about all of the uh, these uh, well Native American you know the original Asian invader sites uh, they spend the quite uh, He cites the 2010 report by the California Energy Commission, which says that 17,000 sites within the Southern California desert region will potentially be destroyed. Yep, you want to, uh, you'll be shocked to hear that the BLM declined a request for an interview. Yep, yep, yep. Um, instead, sending an email talking about uh, 
you, you know, uh, talking about how the BLM has operated within applicable laws and acts, which I have no doubt uh, that it has, uh, because they're doing nothing illegal. There is nothing illegal uh, about the BLM uh, selling off hundreds of thousands, millions of acres of our public lands to these big energy corporations. It's not only is it not illegal and within the law, uh, it is being encouraged. It was being encouraged by Barack Obama. And uh, Joe Biden has taken the reins and gone completely batshit crazy with this. Okay, but a more fundamental question remains. Why build in the desert when thousands of acres of rooftops and urban areas lie empty across California? Quote, there are so many other places we should be putting solar, says Clark of the National Park Conserva Conservation Association, from homes to warehouses to parking lots and industrial zones. He describes the current model of large-scale, centralized power generation hundreds of miles from where the power is actually needed as quote, a 20th century business plan for a 21st century problem, the conversion of intact wildlife habitat should be the absolute last resort, but it's become our first resort just because it is the easy fix, close quote. Uh, Vincent Battaglia, founder of Renova Energy, a rooftop solar company, agrees, quote, We've been led to believe that all solar is good solar. All solar is good solar, he says, but it's not when it molests, I love that, molests pristine land requires hundreds of millions of dollars to transmit it to to city centers and loses so much power along the way, it is simply preserving the monopoly of the big energy companies. That is exactly the intention. Do you get it? It is simply preserving the monopoly of the big energy companies that have that little corporate whore, Joe Biden, in their pocket. California recently reduced the incentive for homeowners to install rooftop solar panels after it slashed the amount that they can earn from feeding power back into the grid by about 75 percent. Forecasters suggest that after doubling in size from 2020 to 2022, the market for residential solar installations is expected to decrease by nearly 40% by 2024 as a result. Battaglia is optimistic, yes, that home energy storage is the answer. Batteries are the future, he says. With solar panels on rooftops and batteries in homes, we will finally be able to cut the cord from the big utility companies. Soon, those fields of desert solar farms will be defunct, left as rusting relics of another age, close quote. But back in Lake Tamarisk, the residents are preparing for the long battle ahead. 
they picked on a little town and thought they could wipe us out, says Stedden, but they can't just mow us over like they did the desert tortoises. They thought we were a bunch of uneducated redneck hicks living out here in the desert, says Pierce. We're going to show them they were wrong. Yep, 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 yep. And what is the first comment? There are consequences for producing any kind of energy on a large scale. Pick your preference. Meaning, pick your poison. Pick your poison, frying pan or the fire, or go the Joe Biden route and uh, have your frying pan and your fire. Why well, have to choose? Why well, have to choose between a frying pan and a fire when you can have a frying pan and a fire? If one doesn't kill you or the other one doesn't kill you, put the two together. And we're doomed. But anyway, I've got to wrap up uh, today's chronicle of the collapse and start and find out when my next two solar panels are my two rooftop solar panels for my tiny house will be delivered. I, we put two of them up there, but I uh, don't think it's going to be enough power. We, we want to run both the tiny houses off, uh, so we're going to put two more solar panels here at Bugs on a Jar Farm. We are going solar to save the planet here at Bugs in a Jar, so come hang out in one of our solar-powered tiny houses. Come see me this summer. Yes, little dog. Are you ready to move into your solar-powered tiny house? Bye, guys. We don't need no stinking solar farms.